in uh, in taking this course from 80% hands off to 80% hands on, we're also going to spend a little more time talking about how to be safe, as safe as we can. Okay, as we go through developing these boards, there's going to have to be some safety things, procedures put into place in order to make that happen. Um, one thing is to make sure that uh, everything is properly grounded. We haven't done any of that yet. Uh, all we've been able to do at this point is get these things to operate and we will work towards uh, making it uh, more safe and secure as we go through that this quarter. Those boards are still somewhat in development now and it really needs for you guys to do the labs and prove that they work and, uh, and find out what the issues are. Um, in terms of safety, we will start to follow what is referred to as a lockout tag out procedure. Are anybody familiar with that? You are, Dawn, to some oh, extent, yeah. I'm yes. sure. Um, I was at Oberto yesterday and watch their lockout tag out uh, process. They use the exact same kits that we have. They use the same equipment and they do the same thing. Um, for us, we need to first become established with a process of what lockout tag out means, but more importantly we have to become, uh, we have to avail of ourselves of a culture of trying to be safe. It's difficult to do, but you have to do it. Okay, a lot of times safety comes down to communications and lockout tag out is a communications protocol as well as a safety protocol. Lockout promotes safety, tag out provides communications. Okay, why do we need lockout tag out? What is it and why do we need it? We might be able to lockout, kind of synthesize an answer from the gonna, name. You're going to keep uh, people who don't know what they're doing away from hurting the person that's working with the uh, power, with the wiring. Okay, here's a house, and in that house we have a kitchen. And in the sink of the kitchen, we have a garbage disposal. On the other side of the kitchen, we have Mama's sewing room. And plugged into the wall is a sewing machine. Okay? Here's the timeline. Dad comes home with a new garbage disposal. <laughs> Husband, dad, turns off the breaker. starts to replace the disposal. Yeah, disposal. Hello, it's an I. Thank you. Okay. Three, what do you think step three is? Mom comes <laughs> Mom comes in and turns I was going to say, wife turns it back on. <laughs> yeah. I turn off, I'm yelling through the house, don't you dare touch that power. Sewing machine doesn't work. <laughs> No worky. What happens? She goes down she and turns it on. on. She goes down in the basement, turns on the uh, switch, the breaker, that happens to run both of these things, and Dad's hands down in the bottom of the disposer and turns into meat. Ground beef or ground whatever. Ground <laughs> human. How do we prevent that from happening? Well, the way to prevent it from happening is to put a freaking lock on the breaker, right? If I put a lock on the breaker, nobody else can open it. Nobody can move that breaker. 
okay? That's where lockout comes from. Lockout is a plan by which, I'm going to go get one of these things. Hey, the key's actually up on top of the thing. That's freaking awesome. Here's a lock, and here is a little, I don't know, what does have a name? I think we just always just called it the um, lockout clamp. Yeah, it's a lockout clamp. It goes through the uh, hole that keeps you from turning on the power box, and then if you have more than one person working on it, you can put more than one lock in there. So that if Don is working on one part of the machine, and I'm working on another part of the machine. We can both put our locks on there so that Dawn can't finish up with her work and then just go turn the machine on. She has to, she's going to see another lock on there and say, oh, somebody else has that. Right? The question then becomes who? Which is where we use the tag out part. The tag out part involves putting a tag on this device saying, who is it that locked that out? Now, Dawn, somewhere, you have these tags, right? Ah, yeah, if you grab me, just throw the whole kit over here. Because the problem you run into is that every different type of breaker takes a different kind of lockout mechanism. You just can't go by one lockout for a breaker because different breakers have to have different kinds of mechanisms to lock them out. Right, and we've got a couple different ones that mm -hmm. come in this kit. Uh, here's another another lock. And somewhere, here they are. Here's the uh, the tags. Do not operate. It has room for. It's a plastic coated tag, so you can use a uh, wax marker or something on it, so that you don't use a permanent marker. And it has. This lock and tag may only be removed by whoever, and you put your name on it, and then you put that around the lock so that uh, you can tell who it is that has it locked out. That way if I'm done and I know that you're the one that has it locked out, I can come find you and we'll coordinate together when we're going to test uh, our respective parts of the machine. And typically there's two keys to each lock and one key stays with the person that used the lock and the mm -hmm. other key is usually maintained in a lock box by the company. Mm -hmm. so Got to have a... Some kind of an emergency yeah. or like one day I had a lock out on a circuit and I went home and didn't take the, the um, deal off. And the next day I wasn't at work. And so they called me before removing the lock and said, what status were you in? And I said, this is, this is the last step that needs to be done. Do that, and then you can remove it. So then the company then finished it up and then removed the lock. But no, there shouldn't be more than like two keys. No, it's serious you business. Never share, never share a lock. Somebody. Yeah, it's serious business, especially when you're talking about industrial voltages and currents and 480 volts. And you know, it doesn't take, as you see on uh, in the book, it doesn't take much current to kill you. Um, and the more voltage you have, the easier it is for that current to flow. So higher voltages do provide a higher hazard. The most significant hazard when it comes to electrical things is burns, though, you know, which is probably why. Uh, the National Electrical Code is published by the Fire Prevention. Yeah, I got one of them before. Yes. <laughs> um, so what we need to do is we need to kind of look at the sequence that we're going to follow when we do lockout tagout. Um, it talks about it on page 8 of your textbook. It says there are basic steps to the lockout tagout process. So we're going to talk about those. We're going to legitimatize them so they make sense. And uh, then we're going to move on. Okay, and I'm just going to paraphrase these. If you want to play along with the home version and look at the book, you're more than welcome to. But I'm not just going to read them off. We'll talk a little bit about each one. Uh, the first one is to prepare for machinery shutdown. What does that mean? Usually it means like coordinating with everybody that that circuit, that machine, that line has to be shut down and make sure everybody's aware it won't work. 
if you're in a in a working office or a lab or something, you know, you need to make sure they know that their machines are going to be down. And sometimes they're on timelines, and you can't just do it anytime you want. You have to coordinate a specific time where their machines are not being used. Well, if you take any production machine. And, you know, if they haven't been to Oberto yesterday, if, if Oberto has a machine that makes a ton of beef jerky an hour, right, it's 2,000 pounds of beef jerky, a half a pound of beef jerky sells, sells for six bucks retail. So you figure that's 4,000 times six bucks is how much? $24,000. So that's how much it's costing Oberto when that machine is down for an hour. So the question is, when do we do that shutdown? What other people are affected by that? What happens if we shut down this, this 2,000 pound an hour Oberto machine? What about the people in the packing department? There's no product. What am I going to do with them? So there's a preparation that has to take place in an industrial setting. Yeah, unless it's emergency driven, uh, a lot of times it's, well, we're going to do this preventative maintenance on this machine now because we don't want it to break, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. We're going to schedule that for next Thursday. There's going to be a meeting and they're going to figure that out. It's all going to be scheduled. Okay? Part of it has to do with that communications. What else? What needs to be done? in terms of shutting it down. Where's the power coming from? What am I going to use this lock on to make sure that I don't get power? Okay, so you're going to do a survey. You're going to find out where all of the energy comes from in that particular area that sources that machine. Wouldn't it suck to have a situation where you turn off the power to the machine and unbeknownst to you, a backup generator kicks in because you shut it off too far back in the system. That's going to suck if that happens because then the backup generator is going to come on, you're going to think there's been no power and then, oops, there it is. What needs to be done? How are we going to effectively shut down the power so that this device is, uh, is isolated, which is really the main goal here. Okay? So then, once we figured all that out, then we're going to do what? What's on the list? You guys have the book in front of you. Actual shutdown. Machinery equipment shutdown. That's the isolation there. So we're like right here. Oh, lockout, tagout application. Right, machinery or equipment shutdown is on page uh, nine. No, oh, well, we just talked about this one. <laughs> <laughs> He's out of sequence. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> We're giving you our time. No, well, we haven't talked about the third one yet. We haven't really talked about that. Well, you kind of said You just it. did. You did. You talked about making sure how to isolate it, yeah. how to make sure the power is shut down. You talked about place. Yeah, backup generator coming on. And you didn't yes, know. but yeah. there's a difference between figuring out how to isolate it and actually isolating it. We have to know what we're going to do beforehand. Then, once we figure that out, then we will go ahead and move forward with our plan. Okay? Actual shutdown. When we talk about actual shutdown, what does that mean? That's basically at the machine. We've not done lockout. We are actually shutting down the equipment. We don't want to disconnect the power from it until we turn it off. Okay, so we have to perform an actual shutdown, which is basically if I'm gonna if I'm gonna do work on that board, then the actual shutdown involves turning this off. Or if I have a motor running, pressing the stop button on the motor. That's what we mean by actually shutting it down. We're not isolating anything yet. We're not locking anything out. We're simply shutting down the equipment. Okay? 
Now, with step three, is where we get isolation. Disconnecting. Okay, they talk about machine or equipment isolation. And then it says in there that you should do this. I'm going to turn this around so that I can videotape my stupid self over here. It says that we should do this when shutting this off. I do have this completely unplugged, so I realize I'm not following the rules given, but this has already been completely de-energized. What they say is when you turn this off, how should I do it? Is this right? Is this the right way to disconnect that? Or is this the right way to disconnect it? That's the right way. You always turn away from the panel and you stay as far away from it as you can because if that panel blows, you don't look at it. That's right. You stay away from, you, you turn away from the energy. If it blows, you want it to blow at your back or your side and not at your face. That's correct. Okay, so when we remove or disconnect things, there's things that are called arc flash. There's all kinds of different things that can happen when we interrupt power. People don't understand that in a, in a panel box, even just everyday dust can mm -hmm. cause that thing to short out and blow. Yep. That's, That's why you never point. ever, even in your home panels, you never look at it because just the right amount of dust hitting across those bus bars will blow that thing. So and you know, that's, that's an issue in the farming industry too. Uh, when you have silos, grain silos full of grain, and when they get stirred up, that grain turns into a powder. And if you light a match in there, it's just mm -hmm. all it's going to go up, uh, create a firestorm. Then the heat brings in air, which just creates a firestorm. You basically created a jet engine. Uh, and the same thing is true here. Oxygen burns. We all know oxygen burns. So you know, when you get it hot enough, it's going to happen. So that's why we have to make sure, and we'll talk a little bit about arc flash uh, towards the end of the quarter. Um, once we have isolated, then we are going to apply, going to apply this pen to that garbage can over there. Oh, is this thing, up to turn oh, that turn around, thank you. Yeah. Uh, then we're going to apply our lockout tag out. We're going to put the lock on there. We're going to fill out this little card. Actually, what they do a lot of the time is they issue you a card, and in the permanent marker, you put your name and information on there. And the reason why is because, like, um, what do they call them, the China markers? The oh, yeah, they rub off. They rub off, and then yeah. they don't know whose card that is, and they don't know where to find you. Plus, you know, compared to the cost of a limb or a human life, these things are pretty cheap. Yeah. I mean, even the kit comes with, I don't know, at least 15 or 20 of these. So they're, they're, they're not something that is necessary to reuse because you're going to put on the back of it, there's remarks. Mm -hmm. So those remarks generally aren't going to apply. These are coated with a material that I think helps the ink stay in. Yeah. Helps the ink stay in there. Okay, so we'll apply the lockout tag out that's listed under lockout and tag out application. That's basically a question of turning the uh, switch off, putting the lock, and however many people are working on it. I've seen these. I've I have seen these with another one hanging on to it hmm. that's locked, so that you have to have all six people here unlock before this will unlock. I've seen them full before too. Yeah, they they can get very full. I've seen them. In, well, the place that I saw them full is at the sorting station in downtown Washington, D.C. at the post office. They have these machines that are probably half as long as this building that process and sort mail based on uh, zip codes and stuff. And uh, these things, it takes a bunch of mail and it sorts them all out. If there's a jam or something, if somebody stapled, put a staple through there, something happens, they've got to shut the whole machine down. They've got two or three guys that have to go through and find out where it is. Each one of them is going to put a lock on that. On the, like in, in, in troubleshooting a circuit or something, that's that's true. Sometimes you're working in pairs or groups and you'll each take a section 
to troubleshoot or a specific area to try and figure out where the problem is. And that's where a lot of the, you'll have multiple locks. Yeah. So that you can't turn the power on until everybody's done. Yeah, that's right. Okay. The next thing is very important. So important, I'm going to do it in red. Release of stored energy. What are we talking about there? They're discharging any active circuits? On them. Discharging any reactive components. Oh, yeah. oh. Right? If I have batteries, capacitors, Inductors, anything that stores energy, I need to release that stored energy. This applies to mechanical energy as well. If, uh, if I'm working on a paper cutter, and we use the one that's down the, down the way as an example, if I'm working on a paper cutter, here's my paper cutter, there's the handle, and there's the blade. Am I, and this is just a manual device, but if I was to work on that paper cutter, do you think I'd want to work on it with the blade in the up position or the down position? Down. Probably in the down position because if I stuck anything hand or otherwise, this has potential energy. Even though it's not falling right now, the minute my wrist or something hits this spring and it decides it doesn't have enough tension to hold this up anymore, down it comes, right? That's also included and we talk about release of stored energy. If the machine is in a condition where there's something that could happen, spring-loaded or otherwise, then you need to address that. In many cases, there'll be a pin that you can use, kind of like the, the hood on your car, where you can basically, in a sense, lock this out by forcing it to be open. And they do have mechanical lockout tagout as well for some types of equipment. Release the stored energy. Okay? Then, what's next? What's item number four or whatever it is on there? Verification of isolation. Verification of isolation. That would be number six. How are we going to do that? <laughs> Use a meter. And here's the most interesting part of the process. Step seven is remove the lockout tagout. Lockout tagout removal. Nowhere in that list does it say to actually do the work. But the work gets done here. Once the work is done, you remove your lock and your tag. If there are other locks and other tags on there, then you're going to have to coordinate with them because you may have to wait for them to finish before you find out if what you did worked. Okay, so it's really a simple process when you think about it from a distance. Turn everything off. Let everybody know you're doing it. Make sure nobody can undo it. Make your repairs and turn it all back on. It's just a really verbose way of telling us what we already, in a lot of senses, know. A lot of people fail here. A guy in my neighborhood failed here. Thing I can't really. 
guy in my neighborhood three doors down from me when I was in high school, he was out working on his car, and he was out working on his car the next morning as well, and the next afternoon. And it wasn't until it had been at least 30, almost 30 hours, that somebody finally figured out that, uh, that the jack had let out and had crushed him underneath the car. Pushed down as long as he couldn't breathe, with boa constrictor death. Because that energy was still stored. He was yeah. using a jack to hold up his car when you're supposed to do what? Hydraulic jack is not made to hold car up. It is not it made up. to keep you alive. You use jack stands. When exactly. you use jack stands, <laughs> that removes the storage yeah. of that energy at that point. You're not relying on compression of some air or some fluid that's in a vessel. So, you know, this is a very common point of failure, at least of stored energy. Okay, any questions on that? All right, let's move on. We're also supposed to be talking a little bit at least it says so that on day four we're supposed to talk about electrical drawings. And I am going to uh, introduce that. Really, we should have covered the lockout, tagout stuff yesterday, but since uh, I was at the doctor and at Oberto yesterday morning, we covered that today, and now we're going to cover the material that's supposed to be covered today, which is electrical drawings. Now this is where things get a little bit different based on what you've done in the past. Our electrical drawings for the last two quarters have looked like this. We've always used schematics. We're not going to use those anymore. Yay! Well, we will, the, <laughs> we will in the 126 class, but not in this class. In the 140 class, <laughs> we're not going to use that anymore. What we're going to use is we're going to use something called ladder logic. Don, it's, it's happening. I know. I know that you've been waiting for this with... I've been dreading this truly gargantuan amounts of anticipation. Simple process that I just couldn't get my head wrapped around. Alright, so what we're going to look at is we're going to look at this stupid thing that is on the wall that kind of looks like this. And it has one of these, and it has one of those, and it has one of those. It's an unhappy person. It's an unhappy <laughs> outlet. Right? <coughs> there are two, two of these and one of those. <coughs> one of these is hot. The other is neutral. And typically, what do we do? What ends up happening with the neutral and the ground? They get tied together. Ground. Quite often, they end up being tied together. Where does that happen? At the fuse box. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's what our, that's what we have. That's what's delivered uh, to our factories, houses, in some form or another. We have a hot, we have a neutral ground. Okay. So everything we do that's plugged in basically happens between hot and neutral. Everything we plug in goes between those two terminals, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. So that's how we're going to represent this. We're going to call hot L1 for line 1 and neutral L2 for line 2. And these will be rails. We have a hot rail and we have a neutral rail.
Okay, so if you look over there on the wall, you'll see that there are, not on the wall, but underneath the oscilloscopes, you'll see that there are rows of outlets. Those are all individual opportunities to press or to insert or power something up between the hot and the neutral. This is what, how many volts? Roughly 120? Mm -hmm. And this is ground or zero volts? And all of the circuits that we look at are going to look like this. We're going to have a control. In this case, it will be a switch and a load. And this is what we call a run. And in this situation, simple as it can be, when you press the switch, the light comes on. When you let up on the switch, the light goes off. Is there a thunderstorm? It's getting ready to rain. <laughs> okay, so I may have switch one. Everything is labeled. L1. I may also have L2. Now I have two lights that come on when I push down on that switch. Mr. Landon? Yes, dear. How about making the uh, neutral L, uh, L-O? What's that? Because you have two L-2s. That would be confusing for someone who didn't know about wiring schematics. Uh, normally, we don't label these. Oh, I'm, I'm used to seeing it. Yeah, but uh, uh, you can call it, and that takes you right back to how different people represent yeah. things. Uh, I might not call this L-2. I may call it L-A-2. Or something. But you're right, it could be confusing. So now I've added another rung, second rung, and in this situation, I'm controlling a light, and let's change that. I was going to say it would make more sense something else. Let's make it something else. Let's make it uh, a motor. Okay, now if I want to have the motor run, what do I have to do? The only way I can get a complete circuit is to press mm -hmm. SW2 and SW3. So SW2 is over here, SW3 is over there. Once I press both of those buttons, that makes sure that my hand is out away from that motor. And the only way that motor can turn is if my hands are pressing those two switches. So it's a safety safety aspect. Okay, this is what a typical electrical drawing looks like. This is a ladder logic diagram or ladder logic drawing. This is the way that people represent processes in industry. When we talk about machinery like what we're working with over there or like the conveyor belt that's in there, there's a program for that because ultimately when you program this, you're programming this or you're doing this with pictures, right? Mm -hmm. 
That's the way we program PLCs. If I want to eventually program a PLC, I'm going to create a drawing that looks very similar to this, and I'm going to send it through USB to the PLC, which will then run that function. Okay, it's probably a little bit abstract right now, but as you go through the quarters and you work up towards fifth and sixth quarter, that's what you're going to see. You're going to be sitting over on the dark side over there programming a computer with these types of symbols, and you're going to send that information into a PLC, and the PLC will emulate that process. Cool. Okay, that's why it's so important that we do this here to make sure that you're ready for that when you get over there. Okay. Now, this is like Tinker Toys, because what we're ultimately going to be doing is, yes, we'll play with switches and we'll play with motors and some of this stuff, but we also have a lot of other different types of components, such as sensors and time delay switches and uh, contactors and relays that we're eventually going to learn how to add to our schematic and our, uh, to our ladder diagram to do some pretty cool things. <coughs> okay? So that's where we're going in the 140 class. Yes, we will talk about motors individually because it's part of the course, but really the emphasis on the course is on all of this. <coughs> okay? All right, that should bring us up to speed on uh, 140 through day four. We'll be working more with electrical drawings. Well, you guys will when you start to work on the board over there, which you're going to be working on shortly. All right? <coughs>